Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome to the webinar. This informational webinar is for people interested in applying to the Department of Energy's Office of Indian Energy's Funding Opportunity Announcement, or FOA, entitled Energy Technology Deployment on Tribal Lands 2020, which was issued March 27, 2020. My name is Lasana Pierce, and I'm a senior engineer with the Department of Energy and the Deployment Supervisor for the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs, otherwise known simply as the Office of Indian Energy. I've been working in clean energy for the last 25 years, and specifically in Indian energy since the late 1990s. Under the Office of Indian Energy, I'm tasked with implementing the deployment program, specifically for financial assistance that entails issuing funding opportunity announcements, managing the application review process, and administering some of the resulting grants and overseeing the funded tribal energy projects. I also have with me Tweety Doe, who is another project officer with the office, duty stationed um, in Colorado with myself. Tweety, would you like to introduce yourself, please? I would, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, greetings from the safety and comfort of my home, and I hope uh, you are also safe, sane, and fed in your home. Um, as Lizana said, my name is Tweety Doe. I have been with the Department of Energy for nearly 11 years, and I have the honor of serving as the project officer for the Office of Indian Energy for the past three or so years. I hope to meet and work with some of you in the very near future. Please take care. Thank you, Tweety. And I'll start the webinar, but because there's uh, so much information, Tweety and I might swap off, um, off and on throughout the presentation. So let's begin. The intent of this webinar is to cover the basic aspects of the funding opportunity announcement, again, otherwise known as a FOA, and highlight essential details about the application process, including the types of applications being sought, who is eligible to apply, cost share, and other requirements what the applications need to contain, how to ask questions, and how applications will be reviewed and selected for funding. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to the email address, tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov, in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. This is the official mailbox to direct all of your questions during the entire FOA process. Please do not contact DOE or DOE laboratory staff the contractors directly with any questions, including myself, as all questions must be in writing. The reason for only accepting questions in writing is to ensure you receive a formal response and so that everyone has the benefit of that same response. Typically, because if you have a question, other potential applicants likely have a similar question. As we will not have a question and answer session as part of the webinar, please capture your questions as they come up and send them via email to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. In the subject line of your email, please also include the FOA number, DE-FOA-0002317. Unless a similar question has already been asked, responses to questions received at this mailbox will be posted to the Frequently Asked Questions, or FAQs, webpage for this FOA on AERE Exchange. Responses to your questions will typically be posted within about three business days after receipt. Before submitting a question, please check the FAQ's webpage on AERE Exchange website to see if a similar question has already been answered. In submitting a question, please be careful not to include any language that might be business sensitive, proprietary, or confidential. Your participation in this webinar is completely voluntary. There are no particular advantages or disadvantages to the application evaluation process with respect to your participation in the webinar today. These slides and an audio recording of this webinar will be posted in the next week or so. As a registrant of the webinar, you will be notified when this material is available on the Office of Indian Energy's website. Note that if there are any inconsistencies between the funding opportunity announcement, this presentation, or statements from DOE or other personnel, the FOA document is the controlling document and applications should rely solely 
on that FOA language or seek clarification by sending your questions to tribal grants at headquarters.doe.gov. These slides and a webinar recording of the webinar will again be posted in the next week or so. And as a registrant, you'll receive an email with uh, when the information is available. So let's get started. Next slide, please. Before we get into the funding opportunity announcement, I wanted to provide a brief overview of the Department of Energy and the Office of Indian Energy. As many of you may not be familiar with the department or the office. The overall mission of the department is to ensure American security and prosperity by addressing its energy, environmental, and nuclear challenges through transformative science and technology solutions. Next slide, please. Thank you. The tribes advocated for an assistant secretarial office within the department and through the Energy Policy Act of 2005, the office was authorized. As such, the Office of Indian Energy is, what is one of about a dozen assistant secretarial level offices within the Department of Energy. Next slide, please. As authorized under the Energy Policy Act of 2005, the Department of Energy's or DOE's Office of Indian Energy assists in administering the staggering gaps and barriers for Indian tribes, which for this slow include Alaska Native Regional Corps and Village Corps, intertribal organizations and tribal energy development organizations interested in developing their vast undeveloped energy resources. Specifically, the office is charged by Congress to promote Indian energy development, efficiency and use, reduce or stabilize energy costs, enhance and strengthen Indian tribal energy and economic infrastructure, and to bring electric power to, uh, in service to Indian lands and homes. Next slide, please. The mission of the Office of Indian Energy is to maximize the development and deployment of strategic energy solutions that benefit tribal communities by providing American Indians and Alaska Natives with the knowledge, skills, and resources needed to implement successful strategic energy solutions. You can see just a few of the projects the office has provided financial support for in the pictures on the right. And now, on to the funding opportunity announcement. Next slide, please. So to achieve its mission, the Office of Indian Energy offers competitive grants, technical assistance, and education and capacity building to assist consenting Indian tribes, including Alaska Native Regional Corps and Village Corps, and other tribal organizations in overcoming the unique regulatory and economic challenges to developing their vast energy resources. With respect to financial assistance, between 2010 and 2019, the office has invested nearly 85 million in more than 180 tribal energy projects, valued at over $180 million. Significant investments that yield tangible results. In fact, in 2019 alone, we awarded 27 new grant agreements expected to result in 19 megawatts of new generation. Next slide, please. <coughs> me. Before we discuss the funding opportunity announcement, I want to walk you through the EERE Exchange site and where you find the FOA document itself, the application forms, and the frequently asked questions. The EERE Exchange website is at eere-exchange.energy.gov. And once on that page, scroll down to the list until you can locate the FOA number or you can search for it. Clicking the FOA number in the FOA list will take you to the section of the webpage specific to this FOA as shown on the slide. As you can see on the slide, the EER Exchange website, the specific section for this FOA, which is DE FOA 0002317, includes a brief summary and other key information. The direct link to this FOA a summary is at the bottom of the slide. And again, my apologies for the legibility of the slide. The screenshot is going to be expanded in the next few slides. 
To apply for the FOA, start by registering with EERE Exchange and then clicking the Apply button shown on the left of the slide. During the process, a control number will be assigned. Retain this number as it needs to be used as an identifier and is required on all of your application documents. Note also that there are manuals on the site which will provide you more directions on registering and on how to submit an application. Next slide, please. So as you can see from this screenshot, the EERE Exchange summary for the FOA includes the, the FOA document itself for download, required application documents, contact information for submitting questions regarding the FOA, and for EERE Exchange support. A link to the Frequently Asked Questions, FAQ's webpage, and the submission deadline of July 1st, 2020 at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Remember, that's Eastern Time, so please plan accordingly and adjust whichever time zone you are located. If the application documents are not shown, you'll need to click the View Required Application Documents link under Required Application Documents. Once the View Required Application Documents link is clicked, a list of the required application documents will be revealed and which I'll show you on the next slide. Next slide, please. As you can see, once you click on the few required application documents under required application documents, you'll see the various forms and templates that need to be included as part of your application. Note that these are not the entirety of forms and documents that comprise a complete application. The forms and templates on Exchange only comprise part of your application and in them of themselves, do not complete an application. The other elements of the application will need to be self-generated by the applicant. Further into the presentation, we'll go through all the elements that comprise the complete application. So the forms and templates include the application for federal assistance, which is SF-424. It's a fillable PDF form. A summary slide template, which is a PowerPoint slide intended to summarize your proposed project. The work plan template, which is a Microsoft Word template and instructions to be used in preparing the required project work plan for your proposed project. The project's metrics data file, which is an Excel file to capture key information on your project. An options analysis template, which is a Microsoft Word template and instructions to be used in preparing the requisite options analysis. Eligibility statements and evidence. This is a Microsoft Word template for information relative to the applicant's eligibility and land status eligibility. The uh, evidence required to support DOE's eligibility determination a certification of the information by an authorized representative of the applicant. The next form um, is the budget justification worksheet, which is the IE335, and it's a multi tab Microsoft Excel workbook for capturing budget details for the applicant, and if applicable, a subrecipient budget a justification worksheet for those participants who meet the threshold requirements. And we'll discuss the budget forms and the thresholds in more detail later in the presentation. The budget support template is a Microsoft Word template that uh, includes additional information and documentation to support your proposed project. There's also a registration certification, which is the Microsoft Word document that certifies for a certification by an authorized representative of the applicant that the applicant has registered in the various systems needed to apply and to receive an award under this FOA. And lastly, Disclosure of Lobbying Activities, SFLL. It's a Word document. And this, if this does not apply to you, please just indicate not applicable, sign date, and include as part of your application. Again, all other elements comprising a complete application are self-generated. And for a complete list of the application elements, see the table on pages six and seven of the FOA. 
And at the bottom of the slide, you'll see the frequently asked questions or FAQs, which we dis we'll discuss on the next slide. Next slide, please. The answers to all FOA-related questions received in our mailbox, which is tribalgrant at hq.doe.gov, will be posted on the Frequently Asked Questions FAQ webpage specific to this FOA on the EERE Exchange website. This slide shows an example of the FAQ webpage from a previous FOA. Please check this page periodically as questions and answers will continue to be posted throughout the entire time the FOA is open. Please also check this page before submitting a question as a similar question may have already been answered. Next slide, please. On the cover of the FOA, you'll find some key dates. The FOA has already been posted and we are conducting the FOA informational webinar now. All applications are due on the EER Exchange website no later than 5 o'clock Eastern on July 1st, 2020. Again, note that this is 5 o'clock Eastern time, and you need to plan accordingly and adjust for your time zone. Please also note that DOE will not extend the submission deadline for applicants that fail to submit the required information due to server connection congestion. Also, EERE Exchange is designed to enforce the deadline specific to the SOA. The apply and submit buttons may be disabled at the defined submission deadline. Therefore, please ensure you begin uploading your complete application at least 48 hours in advance of the submission deadline to ensure that you meet the deadline and allow, allow at least an hour to submit the application documents. Note that once the application is submitted, uh, you may revise or update your application up until the deadline. DOE anticipates notifying applicants selected for negotiation of award in the fall of 2020 and making awards approximately 90 days after the receipt of any requested supplemental information. Each and every applicant will receive a notification letter by email to the technical and administrative points of contact designated by the applicant in the ERE exchange. Notification letters will be sent whether the application is determined to be non-compliant or an incomplete application or late, ineligible due to not meeting the eligible requirements beginning on page 24 of the FOA document, non-responsive as defined as section 1C, application specifically not of interest, beginning at the bottom of page 31 of the FOA document, if they're not selected for funding, selected for funding is postponed, not selected for funding but designated as an alternate, or selected for negotiation towards an award. Again, each and every applicant will receive a notification letter by email. And the notification letter will state the basis upon which those decisions were made. Next slide, please. So even though we will go through much of the information contained in the funding opportunity announcement in this webinar, I would urge you to read the FOA and then read it again. Next slide, please. So to apply for the FOA, applicants must register with and submit applications through EERE Exchange at the URL shown here. As previously discussed, frequently asked questions or FAQs for this SOA can be found on the FAQ page specific to the SOA on Exchange. You will also need to register in grants.gov at www.grants.gov so that you'll receive automatic updates when amendments to the SOA are posted, if any. Note that applications will only be accepted through ERE Exchange, not through grants.gov. Next slide, please. Regarding registrations, the EERE exchange registration does not have a delay. However, the remaining registration requirements could take several weeks to process. All potential applicants lacking a DUNS number or not registered in SAM or FedConnect must complete those registrations prior to submitting an application and they will need to be certified that those have been completed by an authorized representative 
of the applicant. So please see part 6.b of the FOA beginning on page 80 for information on how to register in the above systems. It is really important that you register in these other systems as soon as possible, again, as these registrations need to be completed prior to submitting an application. Again, remember that an authorized representative will need to certify that these registrations have been completed and submit that certification as part of your application. See the registration certifications template under the required application documents on the ERE exchange. Regarding obtaining the DUNS number, in July 10th, 2019 Federal Register Notice, OMB and GSA announced plans for the transition, pardon me, away from the former nine-digit DUNS number to a new 12-digit non-proprietary unique entity identifier, UEI number. During 2020, the DUNS number will be incrementally phased out and replaced with this new UEI number with estimated completion date of December 31st, 2020. The transition will occur at the time the non-federal entity registers in SAM.gov for the first time or renews their registrations, which is on an annual basis. SAM.gov will generate the UEI number and assign it to the non-federal entity along with new login credentials issued through login.gov. Next slide, please. So notice, all applicants are strongly encouraged to carefully read the funding opportunity announcement, which is, uh, wrong, <laughs> PE-FOA-000-2317, um, sorry about that, it's incorrect on the slide, and adhere to the stated submission requirements. This presentation summarizes the contents of the FOA, however, again, if there are any inconsistencies between the FOA and this presentation or statements from DOE or other personnel, the FOA is the controlling document. An applicant should, should rely solely on the FOA language or seek clarification from DOE. So if you believe there are inconsistencies, please contact us by sending an email to, again, tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. So the agenda for this webinar is as shown here. First, we'll provide a summary of the FOA requirements for the Office of Indian Energy uh, FOAs and required application elements, discuss the application specifically not of interest, discuss award information, go over who's eligible to apply, cost sharing requirements, discuss the content and the form of a complete application, um, application eligibility requirements, the merit review and selection criteria and process, again, the registration requirements, which we've touched on, and how to submit an application and your points of contact. Also, how to submit questions and best practices, and then we'll have closing remarks. So just a reminder that we will not have a question and answer session as part of this webinar, so please capture your questions as they come up and send them to via email to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. And again, these slides and an audio recording of this webinar will be posted in the next week or so. And as a registrant of the webinar, you'll be notified when the material is available on the Office of Indian Energy's website. And again, if there are any inconsistencies between the FOA, this presentation, or statements from DOE or other personnel, the FOA document is the controlling document and applications should rely solely on that FOA language or seek clarification. Next slide, please. We'll begin with a summary of the funding opportunity announcement, requirements, and application elements. Remember that every FOA is unique, and even though this FOA may be similar to the previous FOA issued, there have been some changes to help clarify the documents and the requirements. So please read this FOA and ensure you understand the requirements of this particular FOA. 
<laughs> Next slide, please. So the uh, FOA executive summary beginning on page one of the FOA document includes key information on the FOA. This information is summarized on this and the next few slides. And we'll go over this information as part of the presentation, but it is uh, provided here as a summary. There are four topic areas under which you can submit an application as described in the FOA summary. And we'll discuss each topic area in more detail later in the presentation. Note that like the last FOA our office has issued, this FOA is also fuel and technology neutral. Subject to congressional appropriations, we expect between 10 to $15 million to be available and to be uh, making six to 12 awards as a result of this FOA. And I'll give you just a moment to read through the slides. Next slide, please. Continued on this slide is additional key information relative to the FOA. As indicated, depending on whether your proposed project is a facility scale or community scale, the FOA establishes minimum and maximum award thresholds. For facility scale projects, DOE funding per individual award is no less than $50,000. It can be up to a maximum of a million. This applies to topic area one and topic area 3A. And for community scale projects, from no less than 250,000 up to a maximum of the of $2 million, which applies to topic area two, topic area 3B, and topic area four. Awards under this FOA will be grants with the period of performance of each award of approximately one to two years, but no longer than three, and this includes the mandatory 12-month verification period. Next slide, please. Continued on this slide and the next few slides is additional information relative to the funding opportunity announcement. We'll go over the eligible applicant requirements in detail on subsequent slides, so I'll forego an explanation now. Please note, however, that DOE will not make eligibility determinations for potential applicants prior to the date on which applications to this FOA must be submitted. You may ask clarifying questions relative to the FOA, but DOE will not determine whether an applicant or a specific project is eligible during the application preparation stage of the process. As such, the decision of whether to submit an application in response to this FOA lies solely with the applicant. Note that per statute, there is a 50% cost share requirement, meaning 50% of the total allowable cost of the project must be provided as cost share. The total cost of the project is the sum of the DOE share and the recipient share of allowable costs. For instance, if a proposed project is estimated to cost a total of $500,000, the required cost share would be $250,000, or 50% of the total project cost of $500,000. Next slide, please. As indicated in the FOA summary on page two of the FOA document, in addition to the ability to consider geographic and technology diversity, the optimum use of available DOE funding to achieve programmatic objectives and qualified opportunity zones, the selection official may give, also give additional consideration to projects which serve tribal communities with high energy costs, projects proposed grid and or applications who have not provided uh, have not previously received a grant from the Office of Indian Energy. Furthermore, the Office of Indian Energy may upon request provide technical assistance to all eligible applicants who apply under this FOA on a priority basis over those who do not apply to this FOA. If DOE's Office of Indian Energy determines it is with it is within scope and budget. 
Now remember the technical assistance to tribal entity is, is free. It's a free service. Um, you could read more about that on our website. Also be aware that you may submit more than one application to the FOA, including more than one application to a particular topic area, provided each application is for a distinctly different project and addresses only one topic area. Each application must have a distinct title, unique control number as assigned by EERE Exchange during the registration process, and be readily distinguishable. Pardon me. Next slide, please. Note that a constant paper is not required under this FOA. Only full applications are due. As mentioned previously, applications will only be accepted through EERE Exchange and required forms and templates are available under the FOA on the EERE Exchange as previously discussed. As was also previously discussed, DOE will notify all applicants of its eligibility and selection determination via a notification letter by email. The notification letter will inform applicants with eligible applications if its application was selected for award negotiations or not selected, and those applicants will also receive written feedback at the time of that notification. Ineligible applicants will not be reviewed or considered for award. If determined ineligible, the contracting officer will send notification letter by email and state the basis upon which the application is ineligible and not considered for further review. Next slide, please. The requirements included on pages three and four of the FOA document and listed on this slide are not all inclusive and cannot exclusively be relied upon as they do not reflect all evaluation factors and requirements of the FOA. Applications must read, applicants must read the entire FOA to determine the complete set of requirements under the FOA. So pre-award costs, except for pre-award costs with prior DOE approval, only cost share contributions made during the period of the performance of the grant, if awarded, can be considered. Any costs incurred prior to award selection cannot be considered as cost share or for reimbursement by DOE. Registration requirements. The mandatory registration requirements were previously discussed and are summarized on page three of the FOA and included under section 6.b.1 of the FOA document. Also remember that an authorized representative of the applicant will need to certify that these registrations have been completed and that certification submitted as part of your application. Eligibility statements and evidence. As previously mentioned, all applications are required, all applicants, pardon me, are required to submit eligibility statements and provide evidence of the applicant and land status eligibility to support DOE's eligibility determination. Statements of commitment and cost sharing. The statements of commitment and cost sharing will be discussed in greater detail later in the presentation. However, as this is a change from the previous FOA, the applicant commitment and cost sharing is now a separate file from the participant commitment and cost sharing file. Specifically, all applicants are required to submit an applicant tribal council resolution or declaration of commitment and cost sharing file, which must include a statement of commitment and cost sharing by the applicant. For Indian tribes, that statement of commitment and cost sharing must be in the form of an executed tribal council resolution. For Alaska Native regional corporations or village corporations, intertribal organizations, and tribal energy development organizations, that statement of commitment and cost sharing may be in the form of a declaration or resolution signed by an authorized representative able to commit the entity. In addition, letters of commitment and cost sharing are required from all other project participants, excluding vendors and those are to be provided under the participant letters of commitment and cost sharing file. 
So see the FOA for instances where a format other than a tribal council resolution will be accepted from a participating Indian tribe. Letters of support. Letters of support by anyone not participating in the proposed project are not required or desired and should not be provided as part of the application. Host award payment. Payment will be made electronically on a reimbursement basis through the automatic, automated clearing house or ACH and, and provided the requ requisite support is provided and are normally re reimbursed within seven to 10 days. However, reimbursement may take up to 30 days. <clears throat> See the FOA for more details. Post reporting, <clears throat> post award reporting requirements. Selected applicants will be required to document progress in quarterly reports and the project results in a comprehensive final report, as well as present as an annual program review to be held each fall in Lakewood, Colorado. For planning purposes, applications should plan to attend and present grant activities each year during the period of performance of the grant, beginning in 2021 for this follow-up. Equipment title and vested interest. Subject to the conditions provided in 2 CFR 200.313, title to equipment acquired under a federal award will be will conditionally vest upon acquisition with the non-federal entity, the applicant. The non-federal entity cannot encumber this property without approval by the federal awarding agency or DOE in this case and must follow the requirements of 2 CFR 200.313 before disposing of the property or the equipment. Note that if the federal share of the financial assistance agreement is more than $1 million, pursuant to the requirements of 2 CFR 910.360 before, for-profit recipients must properly accord Uniform Commercial Code, UCC, financing statements for all equipment with an acquisition cost per unit of $5,000 or more purchased in whole or in part with federal funds. So the UCC requirement is for for-profit entities um, with a federal share of the grant of more than a million dollars. Cost share. Every cost share contribution must be allowable under the applicable federal cost principles as described in section 4.1 of the FOA. In addition, um, I think that's that. In addition, the cost share must be available or accessible at the time of submission of the application. And we'll discuss this more in detail later. Next slide, please. So the content and form of an application will be covered in detail later in the presentation. However, summary of each of the required application elements is included here and on the next slide and on pages six and seven of the FOA document. And I'd recommend that you use this table as a checklist when preparing an application. Also, a change for this FOA is the separation of the applicant commitment and cost sharing file and those of the participants, as we've briefly mentioned. Specifically, see the last two items on this slide. The applicant tribal council resolution or declaration of commitment and cost sharing file and the participant letters of commitment and cost sharing file. Remember, forms and templates can be found on EER Exchange under the required application documents after clicking View Required Application Documents under the FOA description. All other elements are to be self-generated by the applicant. Next slide, please. Shown here are the remaining elements that comprise the complete application. Note that you may submit an application at any time before the due date and that you will be able to update as needed up until the deadline. Please allow sufficient time to ensure you have uploaded all required documents 
and that your application is complete prior to the due date and time. Remember the time is Eastern time. Just as a reminder that if you there are any inconsistencies between the FOA, this presentation, or statements from DOE or other personnel, the FOA document is the controlling document and applicants should rely solely on that FOA language or seek clarification by sending questions to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. And again, as a reminder, these slides and the audio recording of the webinar will be posted in the next week or so. And as a registrant, you will receive an email when that material is available. Next slide, please. So the Funding Opportunity Announcement, or FOA, builds on efforts by DOE to accelerate the deployment of energy infrastructure on tribal lands. Between 2010 and 2019, the DOE Office of Indian Energy invested nearly $85 million in more than 180 tribal energy projects impl implemented across the contiguous 48 states in Alaska. These projects valued at $180 million are leveraged by over 95 million in recipient cost share. Next slide, please. So please remember that the SOA is fuel and technology neutral. And to see the specific topic area of interest for a definition of possible technology options. Eligible applicants include an Indian tribe, which for purposes of this SOA includes Alaska Native Regional Corporations and Village Corporations, intertribal organizations, and tribal energy development organizations, and on whose tribal lands the projects will be located. Note that the applications may also be submitted on behalf of an Indian tribe by an authorized tribal organization, provided evidence of that authority is supplied as part of the application. See the definitions for tribal organization in the FOA and all definitions of eligibility under Section 3B of the FOA. And we'll go over the definitions of eligible entities later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So our funding opportunities are intended to promote energy independence and economic development with the ancillary benefit of providing employment on tribal lands for the use of commercially warranted energy technologies that Native Americans and Alaska Natives believe are best suited to meet their particular needs, their location, and their available energy resources. As such, consistent with the principles of tribal sovereignty and determination and with the, and all of the above energy strategy, projects sought under the plan FOA will be fuel and technology neutral, meaning not only is renewable energy generation eligible, but also conventional technologies such as diesel generators and such. If you are familiar with past funding opportunities, You'll notice that topic area one is focused on facility scale energy generation and energy efficiency measures. Topic area two is directed towards community scale energy generation projects and topic area three for integrated energy systems to power essential buildings during emergency situations or for community resiliency. With this last FOA, we added community energy storage under topic area two, and we add a topic area four, which is focused on electrifying tribal buildings, either through energy infrastructure or through integrated energy systems. And we'll discuss each topic area in a little bit more detail. However, I would urge you to review the specific requirements on the topic area of interest to you. Next slide, please. As previously noted, topic area one is for the installation of energy generating systems and energy efficiency measures on tribal buildings. There are three topic, subtopic areas, one for the installation of energy generating systems, one for the installation of multiple energy efficiency measures, 
and the last for a combination of energy generating systems and at least one energy efficiency measure. Topic area one, for purposes of this FOA, tribal buildings may include a single or multiple tribally owned or controlled buildings located on tribal land, either existing tribally owned or controlled buildings or tribally owned or controlled buildings that are currently being constructed or planned to be constructed during the proposed grant period. And we'll define tribal buildings in a subsequent slide. Topic area two is for the deployment of community scale energy generating systems or energy storage on tribal lands. Projects to be proposed under topic area two are intended solely for energy generating systems that are grid connected. For purposes of topic area two, community scale means serving a substantial number of total buildings within a community or substantial portion of the community's energy load or an entire tribal community. Where for purposes of this FOA, substantial means of ample or considerable amount. An explanation and rationale as to how the proposed project meets the community scale requirement for either topic area two or topic area three B specifically addresses the substantial element is required as part of the technical volume. And again, substantial means of ample or considerable amount. Under topic area three, DOE soliciting applications to install integrated energy systems for autonomous operations, which means independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid to power a single or multiple essential tribal buildings during an emergency situation. That would be topic area 3A, or to power a substantial number of essential tribal buildings for tribal community resilience. That would be topic area 3B. And we'll go over some definitions in the next few slides. But for the purposes of topic area 3B, community scale means serving a substantial number of essential tribal buildings within a community or a substantial portion of the community's energy load or an entire tribal community. Under topic area four, DOE seeking applications for the deployment of energy infrastructure to electrify tribal buildings. Topic area four is intended for the deployment of energy infrastructure or integrated energy systems to provide electricity to a substantial number of unelectrified tribal buildings, where for purposes of this FOA, substantial means of ample or considerable amount. And as with topic area two and topic area three B, or topic area four, you will also need to address substantial as part of the technical volume. Next slide, please. So this matrix, which provides key information on each of the topic areas also included on page eight of the FOA. Note that the requirements reflected in this matrix are not all inclusive and cannot exclusively be relied upon as they do not reflect all the requirements for each topic area. Applicants must read the entire FOA to determine the complete requirements for each topic area. See more detailed descriptions of each topic area under section 1B of the FOA document. The matrix does it also identifies which topic areas are intended for <clears throat> pardon me, are intended for systems that are grid connected or not. Specifically, projects to be proposed under topic area 1A, topic area 1C, and topic area 2 are intended solely for energy generating systems that are grid connected. Projects proposed under topic area 1B, which is energy efficiency, can be for tribal buildings that are either grid connected or not grid connected. Topic area three can be for either integrated energy systems that are normally grid connected, but can be disconnected and function autonomously independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid, or 
integrated energy systems that normally operate autonomous, not connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid. Projects proposed under topic area four are intended for unelectrified buildings, meaning tribal buildings not connected to the tribe, uh, traditional centralized electric power grid or not connected to an integrated energy system operated independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid. And we'll define grid connected and not grid connected on the next slide. So you will also notice that commercially proven warranty technology at the far right of the matrix is a requirement for all topic areas. Additionally, a 12-month verification period is also required as part of any project proposed under this SPOA. For the matrix, an energy options analysis is required for all topic areas. And either a feasibility study and or an energy audit or assessment is also required uh, for all topic areas. Note that topic area two, either 100 kilowatts or 100 kilowatt hours, if it's a battery, are required either by a single individual energy generating system or energy store system or the aggregate of multiple energy generating systems or energy storage systems. Remember for topic area two, community scales means serving a substantial number of the total buildings within a community or a substantial portion of the community's energy load or an entire tribal community. Similarly, for purposes of topic area 3B, community scale means serving a substantial number of essential tribal facilities within a community or a substantial portion of the community's energy load or an entire tribal community. Topic area four is also intended for the deployment of energy infrastructure or in integrated energy systems to provide electricity to a substantial number of unelectrified tribal buildings. Remember that for topic area two and topic area three, B, an explanation and rationale as to how the proposed project meets the community scale requirements, specifically addressing the substantial element is required as part of the technical volume. Additionally, for topic area four, an explanation and rationale as to how the proposed project meets the requirements of a substantial number of unelectrified tribal buildings is required as part of the technical volume. Unlike in previous FOAs, no minimum number of buildings is specified. But rather, the requirement of substantial must be addressed by the applicant. Next slide, please. Next, I wanted to provide some definitions that will be key in deciding the topic area which might apply to your specific situation. Grid connected for purposes of this FOA means connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid where the central, a traditional centralized electric power grid refers to the main power grids in the continental United States, being the Eastern Interconnect System, or the Eastern Interconnect, the Western Interconnected System, the Western Interconnect, and the Texas Interconnected System, or the Texas Interconnect, as well as the interconnected grid system in Alaska that connects Anchorage, Fairbanks, and the Kenai Peninsula. As just mentioned, projects to be proposed under the following topic areas are intended solely for systems that are grid connected. Topic one, topic area 1A for energy generating systems. Topic area 1C, which is energy generating systems and energy efficiency measure. And topic area two for community scale energy generating systems or community energy storage deployment. Projects under topic area 1B, which is for multiple energy efficiency measures for tribal buildings, can be for tribal buildings that are either grid connected or not grid connected. Topic area three, which is for integrated energy systems for autonomous operation, can be for either integrated energy systems that are normally grid connected, but can disconnect and function autonomous from the independent 
traditional centralized electric power grid or in, or in, integrated energy systems that normally operate autonomous or not connected to the traditionalized centralized electric power grid, which includes much of Alaska. And as previously mentioned, projects proposed under topic area four are intended for unelectrical, unelectrified tribal buildings, meaning tribal buildings not connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid or not connected to an integrated energy system operating independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid. Next slide, please. So, for purposes of this FOA, tribally owned buildings um, is a building or buildings where the eligible entity has the authority to augment or modify the building and where the building is either owned by the eligible entity or tribal members or the eligible entity at the long-term lease as a minimum for the useful life of the proposed project. Tribal buildings may include, but are not limited to, tribal member homes, schools, community buildings, clinics, hospitals, tribal government buildings, fire stations, police stations, radio stations, wash areas, utility facilities such as waste, uh, water and wastewater systems, tribal casinos, or tribal businesses. Specifically for topic area one, tribal buildings may include a single or multiple tribally owned or controlled building located on tribal lands. Next slide, please. Thank you. Energy generating systems for purposes of this fellow include combined heat power systems, conventional distributed generating systems, and renewable energy systems. Energy generating systems can be proposed on a facility scale under topic area one and the combination of energy efficiency measures under topic area and in combination with energy efficiency measures under topic area 1C. Energy generating systems on a community scale can be proposed under topic area 2A. And in combination with controls and management systems and energy storage, um, energy systems under topic area 3 and topic area 4. Specifically, combined heat and power systems for purposes of this FOA may include, but are not limited to, integrated systems that simultaneously generate heat power using energy efficient turbines, reciprocating turbines, micro turbines, fuel cells, including waste heat recovery, which is capturing heat discarded by an existing process and using that heat directly or to generate power. Eligible combined heat and power systems may be fueled by any fuel source natural gas, landfill, sewage gas, fuel and gas oil, coal, lignite, coke, biomass, biogas, solid waste, waste gases, or waste process heat. For purposes of this FOA, waste heat recovery systems may be proposed in combination with an existing power system as a combined heat and power system under topic area. 1A, 1C, topic area 2A, and topic area 3. Conventional distributed generating systems for purposes of this FOA include, but are not limited to, gas turbines, combustion, tur uh, com combustion gen um, engines, generators, reciprocating engines, sterling engines, micro turbines, or combustion steam turbines. Renewable energy systems for purposes of, of this FOA include systems for electric power generation and or heating or cooling systems. Renewable energy systems for electric power generation include, but aren't limited to photovoltaic, solar electric, biomass, including waste to energy, wind power, hydropower, either diversion, run of river, small impoundment, or incremental, or other renewable energy hybrid systems for electric power generation. 
Note that for purposes of this fellow, a ground or air source heat pumps are considered an energy efficiency measure. Heating or cooling systems um, include, but aren't limited to, the use of biomass for high efficiency combustion systems, stoves or boilers, active solar thermal systems for space or water heating, wind energy for heating, direct use hydrothermal with geothermal resources for water, and space heating or other renewable energy hybrid systems for heating and or cooling. Energy efficiency measures for purposes of this FOA means the implementation of either a building efficiency measure or an industrial process efficiency measure. Remember the multiple EEMs can be proposed under topic area 1B and at least one energy efficiency measure under topic area 1C in combination with the energy generating system or system. So building energy efficiency measures may include, but are not limited to, the building envelope improvements, which is improvements to walls, roofs, foundation slabs, ceiling, windows, doors, insulation, the installation of energy efficiency equipment, high efficiency lighting and controls, efficient appliances, smart or programmable thermostats, air sealing, moisture management, controlled ventilation, high R value or high thermal resistance, insulation, high efficiency windows, efficient heating systems, which could be furnaces, boilers, or passive solar, efficient cooling systems, which could be air conditioners, evaporative coolers, ground or air source heat pumps, remember, energy savings building, electrical equipment, efficient mechanical systems, heat recovery ventilation units, and automated building energy management systems. Under the industrial process efficiency measures may include, but aren't limited to, insulating piping, tank walls, and roofs, the installation of higher efficiency equipment, such as heat exchangers, compressors, blower pumps, and fans, minimizing air leaks, optimizing air systems through the use of variable speed drives or adding or optimizing controls. Note that for the purposes of this fellow, waste heat recovery systems in combination with an existing power system are considered energy generating systems. Waste heat recovery not in combination with a power system is classified for purposes of this fellow as a process efficiency measure. For purposes of the FOA, energy efficiency is not the same as energy conservation, which is not eligible under the FOA. So specifically, energy conservation for the purposes of the FOA means decreasing energy consumption by using less of an energy service or going without an energy service to save energy. Energy conservation typically involves a behavioral change it may include meters or other indicators to induce that behavioral change. If energy conservation is proposed in response to topic area 1B, the application will be deemed non-responsive and will not be reviewed or considered. So again, please review the definitions um, and ensure that your proposed project meets those requirements. Next slide, please. Got it. Thanks. So specific to topic area two, which is community scale energy generating systems or community energy storage deployment, all proposed projects or buildings on which systems are proposed must be on tribal lands, must be owned or controlled by the eligible entity, and must benefit the eligible entity in the tribal community. However, the substantial number of buildings within the tribal community where the energy or heat is to be used do not need to be owned or controlled by the eligible entity. Next slide, please. So relative to topic area 2B, which is energy storage systems for purposes of this FOA, they include, but they're not limited to, batteries, pumped, hydropower, flywheels, compressed and air energy storage or thermal energy storage systems. Next slide, please. So 
So integrated energy systems must, as a minimum, include energy generating system or system, controls and management systems, and may include energy storage systems. For topic area 3A, that integrated energy system must power a single or multiple essential tribal buildings during emergency situations. For topic area 3B, that integrated energy system or systems must power a substantial number of assist essential tribal facilities within a community or substantial portion of a community load or an entire community. And for topic area four, that integrated energy system must provide electricity to a substantial number of unelectrified tribal buildings. Next slide, please. So it, as indicated on the preceding slide, integrated energy systems under topic area three, topic area four, must as a minimum include energy generating systems, controls and management systems, and may include an energy storage system where the energy generating systems for purposes of this FOA include combined heat power systems, conventional distributed generating systems, and renewable energy systems. Energy storage systems for purposes of FOA include, but are not limited to batteries, pump, hydropower, flywheels, compressed air, energy storage, and thermal energy storage systems, and controls and management systems for purposes of the FOA, but not include, but are not limited to uh, supervisory control and data acquisition status systems, power and frequency controllers, voltage regulators, power protection systems, and the like. Next slide, please. Thank you. Although integrated energy systems must include a minimum of an energy generating systems and controls, and may include energy storage systems, some components may already exist, and therefore, not all of the components need to be proposed for DOE funding. However, the integrated energy system as a whole must meet the requirements under topic area three or topic area four. Next slide, please. Okay, I guess I better talk a little quicker, huh? <laughs> Specific to topic area three, integrated energy systems for autonomous operation, essential tribal facilities for purposes of the FOA are those facilities necessary for providing essential services, where essential services means services that if interrupted would endanger the life, health, or personal safety of the whole or part of the tribal community. Essential services include may include, but are not limited to, emergency facilities or shelters, hospitals or medical services, fire stations, police services, water, wastewater, sewage uh, and sewage communication, electricity, natural gas, telecommunications, including telephone, radio, or television broadcasting, internet in connectivity and broadband, and transportation. Note that I've included a picture here of a casino as they are often used as emergency shelters and are eligible under the FOA. Next slide, please. Under topic area four, electrification of tribal buildings, DOE is seeking applications for the deployment of energy infrastructure to electrify tribal buildings. Topic area four is intended for the deployment of energy infrastructure or integrated energy systems to provide electricity to a substantial number of unelectrified buildings. Where unelectrified for purposes of the FOA means tribal buildings not connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid or not connected to an integrated energy system operating independent of a traditional centralized electric power grid. Note that as part of the technical volume, again, an explanation and rationale as to how the proposed project meets the requirement of substantial number of unelectrified buildings is required. Next slide, please. Thanks. 
specific to topic area for electrification of tribal buildings. Electrification for purposes of this fellow means the process of providing electricity to unelectrified tribal buildings by either deploying energy infrastructure to connect tribal buildings to their traditional centralized electric power grid or deploying an integrated energy system to operate independent of the traditional centralized electric power grid. Electrify for purposes of the FOA means the act of electrification. Next slide, please. In addition to the deployment of integrated energy systems to provide electricity to a substantial number of unelectrified tribal buildings under topic area four, energy infrastructure can also be proposed to provide electricity to a substantial number of unelectrified tribal buildings. Where energy infrastructure for the purposes of this HOA <clears throat> means electric power distribution technology to transport electricity from the transmission system to individual consumers and may include, but is not limited to, distribution substations, circuits, circuit breakers, switchgear, bus bars, distribution lines, distribution transformers, capacitors, voltage regulators, meters, and utility poles, and such. Next slide, please. So now that we've discussed the definitions of each of the topic areas, I wanted to again include the metric uh, matrix summarizing some of the requirements for each topic area again. Remember that this matrix is, is not all inclusive, so you must read the FOA to ensure your proposed project meets the requirements of that specific topic area of interest. I'll give you a minute to review the matrix and remember an options analysis and either a feasibility study or energy audits or audits uh, assessments are required for all topic areas. And all topic areas require that the technology be commercially proven, at least a technology readiness level of nine and be warranty. I'd also like to remind you that we will not have a question and answer session as part of this webinar. So please capture your questions as they come up and send them via email to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. And in the subject line of your email, please include the FOA number, which is DE-FOA-0002168. Unless a similar question has already been asked, responses to questions received at this mailbox will be posted to the Frequently Asked Questions or FAQs webpage for the FOA on the EERE Exchange website. Responses to your questions will typically be posted within three business days after a receipt. Before submitting a question, please check the FAQ webpage on EERE Exchange to see if a similar question has already been answered. In submitting a question, please be careful not to include any language that might be business sensitive, proprietary, or confidential. Additionally, these slides and an audio recording of the webinar will be posted in the next week or so. And as a registrant, again, you will be notified when this material is available on the Office of Indian Energy's website and on the ERE Exchange. So next, we'll talk about applications not of interest. Next slide, please. So the types of applications on this in the next two slides are specifically not of interest and will be deemed non-responsive and will not be reviewed or considered. As the intent of this foe is the deployment of energy technology, activities that do not meet the technical parameters specified in Section 1B of the FOA will be deemed non-responsive. Additionally, applications proposing studies design and engineering, except for final design and engineering, development, which is all the pre-construction activities, or any other activity which does not directly in and of itself result in the installation of equipment to generate electricity and or heating and cooling, reduce energy use, or enhance energy storage and delivery infrastructure will be deemed non-responsive and will not be reviewed or considered. Applications proposing the evaluation of product marketing opportunities 
assessment of manufacturing opportunities, research, design and engineering, with the exception of final design and engineering, product development, or the construction of manufacturing facilities or buildings will not be considered. Next slide, please. To continue, applications proposing the construction of a building or buildings or structures, such as carports, will not be considered. Only the incremental cost associated with the installation of an energy generating system, integrated energy system, or energy efficiency measure will be considered allocable to the proposed DOE funded project and not the cost of constructing the building or the structure, unless those structures are integral to the proposed project. Any application where the applicant has already taken irreversible action regarding the proposed DOE funded project are not of interest. Note that the proposed DOE funded project consists of only the installation of the energy generating system, integrated energy system, community energy storage, energy infrastructure, or installation of energy efficiency measures, not the construction of the building or structures, such as carports. Irreversible actions relative to the proposed DOE-funded project only may include, but are not limited to, site clearing, groundbreaking, equipment system purchase or installation, building renovation, or building retrofits. Next slide, please. To continue, applications proposing energy conservation, as we discussed earlier, are specifically not of interest. This is where energy uh, conservation means decreasing energy consumption by using less of an energy service or going without an energy service to save energy and typically involves a behavioral change and may include meters or other indicators to induce that behavior change. Again, energy conservation measures are not of interest. Neither are applications for commercial or utility scale projects intended solely for revenue generation through the export of electricity off tribal lands for commercial sale are of interest. However, if the proposed energy generating system meets the requirements of topic area 2A, which is community scale energy generating system, portion of the electricity may be sold, provided that the revenue for the sale of that electricity must benefit the eligible entity and the tribal community. Further, if a portion of the electricity is proposed for sale, an explanation of how the revenue from that sale of that electricity will benefit the eligible entity and the tribal community is required as part of the technical volume. Additionally, applications proposing the use of materials, supplies, or equipment which are not commercially proven or warranted are not of interest. Remember, all hardware must be commercially proven and warranty. <coughs> Pardon me. See Appendix A for more details on technology readiness levels. A technology readiness level, or TRL, of nine is required to be eligible under this FOA. Next slide, please. So now on to some award information. Next slide, please. The award information included on this slide is also included as part of the executive summary slides and on page one and two of the FOA document. DOE expects to make 10 to 15 million in federal funds available. The actual level of funding will depend on congressional appropriations. DOE anticipates making between six to 12 awards and may issue awards in one, multiple, or none of the topic areas. Awards are anticipated to be between one to two years, but no longer than three, and includes the mandatory 12-month verification period. Please note that there are different restrictions on the minimum and maximum amount of DOE funding to be requested under each topic area. For facility scale projects, which is topic area 
one and topic area three a doe funding per individual award varies from no less than fifty thousand dollars to a maximum of a million for community scale projects which is topic area two topic area three b and topic area four doe funding per individual award varies from no less than 250000 to a maximum of $2 million. Next slide, please. Next, we'll discuss eligibility. We are not doing good on time. I suspect we will run very late, and I apologize. Now we'll go over some eligibility information. Remember, one of the files that comprise an application is the eligibility statements and evidence file you will be required to complete the template provided and to provide evidence to support DOE's eligibility determination. Please see the Microsoft Word template found under Required Application Documents on the ERE Exchange. Additionally, again, DOE will not make sufficiency determinations prior to an application being submitted. Eligibility for award under this funding opportunity announcement is restricted to an Indian tribe, which for purposes of this OA also includes Alaska Native Regional Corps and Village Corps, intertribal organizations, or tribal energy development organizations, and on whose tribal lands the projects will be located. Other entities to be discussed on the upcoming slide may be able to submit an application on behalf of an Indian tribe or tribes, provided evidence of that authority is conclude, included as part of the application. Next slide, please. The definition of Indian tribe is, is as shown on the slide. Note that eligible Indian tribes are those federally recognized tribes as listed in the Indian entities recognized and eligible to receive services from the United States Bureau of Indian Affairs. And then the latest one is published by Department of Interior's Bureau of Indian Affairs in the Federal Register dated January 30th, 2020, 85, Federal Register 20. And I'll give you a moment to read through the definition. Remember that for purposes of this SOA, an Indian tribe includes Alaska Native Regional Corps and Village Corps as defined and in or established pursuant to the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. For purposes of this SOA, Alaska Native Regional Corps means one of the 13 Alaska Native Regional Corporations as defined in and established pursuant to ANCSA. Alaska Native Village Corps or village corporation for purposes of the FOA is as defined in or established pursuant to the ANCSA tribal consortium, plural of consortia, is defined for purposes of this FOA, means a group of Indian tribes that have chosen to submit a single application under this FOA. A tribal court consortium is eligible to submit an application provided that the application is submitted by a single Indian tribe that represents the consortium. Applications may also be submitted on behalf of an Indian tribe or tribes by an authorized tribal organization, provided evidence of that authority is included as part of the application. Tribal Organization for Public Law 115-245 has the meaning given the term in Section 4 of the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act, 25 U.S.C. 5304. Specifically, per 25 U.S.C. 5304, tribal organization means a recognized government governing body of Indian, any Indian tribe, any legally established organization of Indians, which is controlled, sanctioned, or chartered by such governing body or which is democratically elected by the adult members of the Indian community to be served by such organization, which includes the maximum participation of Indians in all phases of its activities. Provided that in any case where a contract is let or grant made to an organization to perform services benefiting more than one Indian, 
tribe, the approval of each such Indian tribe shall be a prerequisite to letting or making of such contract or grant. Next slide, please. So the second type of applicant eligibility to, to apply under this FOA is an intertribal organization. Intertribal organization, as defined for purposes of the FOA, means any organization comprised of two or more Indian tribes established under congressional, state, or tribal law to act on behalf of the participating Indian tribes. Intertribal organizations may include, but are not limited to, intertribal councils, regional tribal organizations or associations, Alaska regional development organizations, and tribal federations. Next slide, please. In addition to Indian tribes, tribal energy resource or uh, development, sorry, tribal energy development organizations are eligible applicants. And I'll give you just a minute to review the definition. Tribal Energy Development Organization for purposes of this FOA means any enterprise, partnership, consortium, corporation, or other type of business organization that is engaged in the development of energy resources and is wholly owned by an Indian tribe, including Section 17 corporations, and organizations formed under the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act. Note that any organization must have the written consent of the governing bodies of all Indian tribes participating in the organization, where an organization means a partnership, joint venture, limited liability company, LLC, or other unincorporated association or entity that is established to develop Indian energy resources. Projects must also be on tribal lands to be eligible. Next slide, please. To be eligible, the proposed project must also be on tribal lands as defined here. Specifically, tribal lands for purposes of this FOA include Indian land, we'll go over that in more detail on the next slide, lands held in fee simple, which means purchased or owned by the Indian tribe, Tribal um, Energy Resource Organization or other eligible applicant. Lands held under a long-term land lease as a minimum for the useful life of the proposed project. And those are lands held under a long-term land lease by the Indian Tribe, Tribal Energy Development Organization or other eligible applicant. Note that this varies from previous focus and that the land held under a long-term land lease lease is eligible, whereas under previous FOA, only land held under federal land lease was eligible. And tribal lands also includes land that was conveyed to a native corporation pursuant to ANCSA and subsequently conveyed to another entity, provided that entity is either a native village or tribal governmental entity, or the land is held, invested, managed for, and on behalf of a native village or tribal governmental entity. Next slide, please. And for purposes of this FOA, Indian land is defined as defined under the Energy Policy Act of 2005, as shown on this slide. And I'll give you just a moment to read through that. Next slide, please. And for purposes of the FOA, Indian Reservation is as defined here and not as under Energy Policy Act of 2005. And again, I'll give you just a moment to read through that as well. Next slide, please. So just a reminder, DOE will not make eligibility determinations for potential applicants. 
prior to the date on which the applications to this FOA must be submitted. Again, the decision whether to submit an application in response to the FOA lies solely with the applicant. And I want to remind you again that as we will not have questions and answer session as part of the webinar, please capture your questions as they come up and send them via email to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. And again, just a reminder, the slides and audio recording for the webinar will be posted in the next week or so. And as a registrant of the webinar, you will be notified when this material is available. Next slide, please. Next, we'll go over cost sharing. Just a reminder um, <clears throat> to, to send your questions to tribalgrants at hq.doe.gov. Next, on the cost sharing. Per statute, the required cost share under this FOA must be at least 50% of the total allowable cost of the project. Where the total allowable cost of the project is the sum of both the DOE share and the recipient share of allowable costs. Again, for example, if the requested DOE costs are 250000 the cost share would be 250000 or 50% of the total cost of 500000 It is not 50% of the DOE requested amount. Again, cost share is 50% of the total project cost, which in this example are 500000 To assist applicants in calculating proper cost share amounts, DOE has included additional cost share information in Appendix B of the FOA. Next slide, please. All cost share must come from non-federal sources unless otherwise allowed by law. C2 CFR 200.306 and 2 CFR 910.130 are the applicable cost sharing requirements. We'll discuss this further on a sub subsequent slide as there are instances where federal funds can be used as non-federal cost share. Note that except under limited situations and only with prior DOA approval, all costs must be made during the period of performance of the grant. Section 3.B of the FOA provides additional information on cost sharing types, allowability, verification, and payment. Next slide, please. As previously stated, all cost share must come from non-federal sources, unless otherwise allowed by law. Included here and on page 35 of the FOA are a few instances where federal funds can be used as non-federal cost share. Specifically, funding under the Indian Self-Determination Act and the Tribal Self-Governance Funding Agreements are, do specifically state that they can be used as cost share. Next slide, please. Additionally, self-determination contract funding, compact funding, and the HOSTA uh, funding can be used as non-federal cost share. That's the Native American Housing Assistance Self-Determination Act, and the HOSTA. Are additional examples where federal funds that can be used as non-federal cost share. If funds from a federal source are being proposed either as additional federal funds against the total project cost or as non-federal cost share, as allowed by law, the applicant must provide a commitment letter from that federal agency as part of the application. And that commitment letter must specifically commit those funds and identify the statutory authority that allows those funds to be used for the project being proposed. Additionally, if those funds are to be used as non-federal cost share, the commitment letter must also include an excerpt of the statutory authority that allows the funds to be used as non-federal cost share. These commitment letters will be reviewed to determine allowability by DOE legal and the contracting officer prior to accepting funds as either additional federal cost share or non-federal cost share from other federal sources. Next slide, please. Cost share must also be available or accessible at the time of submission of the application as described below. A written assurance or commitment 
must be provided at the time the application submission. The written assurance or commitment is a binding guarantee that funds are available or with respect to use of equipment, contributed labor hours, or unrecovered indirect costs is accessible. Also note that the cost share commitments cannot be dependent on some future event, such as receiving a grant, obtaining a loan, securing an investor. Next slide, please. Although the cost share requirement applies to the project as a whole, including work performed by members of the project team other than the, the recipient, the applicant, the recipient or the applicant is ultimately and legally responsible for the entire amount of the cost share if an award is made. In addition, if an award is made, cost share will be verified once invoiced. Documentation for all costs, evidence of expenditures associated with the project will be required with each and every request for reimbursement from DOE for DOE's portion of that cost. Next slide, please. And again, I think we're going to run, run late, and I apologize in advance. So DOE requires recipients to contribute the cost share amount incrementally over the life of an award on an invoice-by-invoice invoice basis. In limited circumstances and where it is in the government's interest, the DOE contracting officer may approve the request by the recipient to meet his cost share requirements on a less frequent basis. Next slide, please. The total budget included in an application must include both the federal and the non-federal cost share, which combined, again, reflect the total project cost proposed. All costs will be verifiable from the uh, recipient's records and be necessary and reasonable for the accomplishment of the proposed project. Every cost share contribution must be reviewed and approved in advance by the contracting officer and incorporated in the project budget before expenditures are incurred. Next slide, please. On a final note, as all sources of cost share are considered part of the total costs, if selected for funding, cost share dollars will be scrutinized under the same federal regulations as federal dollars requested for the project. Specifically, all costs, whether they be requested for reimbursement by DOE or contributed as cost share, will require the same level of documentation to support those costs as well as undergo the same level of review to determine allowability, allocability, and reasonableness. And again, just a reminder, we're not going to have questions and answers as part of the webinar. Please send your questions to tribalgrants at headquarters.doe.gov. Slides and audio recording of the webinar will be posted next week or so, and you will be notified if you're registered for this webinar. Next slide, please. Again, cost share must be allowable and must be verifiable at the time of submission of the application. Please refer to this chart for your entity's applicable cost principle principles. It is imperative that you follow the applicable cost principles when creating your budget for the application. Next slide, please. So cost share can be provided in cash or as in-kind contributions. It can be provided by the recipient, the sub-awardees, which is sub-recipient or vendors or a third party. Allowable in-kind contributions may include, but are not limited to, contribution of time, unrecovered indirect costs, unrecovered facilities and administrative costs, rental values of buildings, lands, or equipment, not the purchase price, just the rental value for the period of the grant and the value of a service, other resources, or third-party in-kind contributions. And again, only the rental or lease value of buildings, land, and equipment, and only for the period of the grant is allowable, not the purchase price. Next slide, please. Be aware that there are items that are considered unallowable cost share, 
So if a cost is considered unallowable, it cannot be requested from DOE or count as cost share. This slide provides some examples of cost share that is unallowable. For more examples, see page 37 of the follow-up. And I'll give you just a moment to look through that. So please take note that generally any cost before or after the DOE grant period cannot be considered as cost share. So to summarize, if an award is made, cost share must be provided on an invoice by invoice pro rata basis at, as a minimum, the percentage negotiated. And as an example of cost share on an invoice by invoice basis, if an award is executed and the entity is requesting reimbursement of $50,000 and a cost share is 50%, then the cost share reflected on that invoice must be $50,000 which is 50% of the total expenditures of 100,000. Again, if for some reason you're not able to provide cost share on an invoice by invoice basis, you may request a waiver from the DOE contracting officer. Such a request would be, be, would be made after notification of selection, if selected, and prior to award. Next slide, please. Next, we'll cover the content and form of an application. So you remember these slides with the different um, elements of an application. <clears throat> so we'll go over each file as shown on the slide and the next slide. Remember, each of the files shown on this slide and the next are required to complete for a complete application. A similar table is included as part of the executive summary on pages six and seven, and on pages 43 and 42 and 43 of the FOA document. I would urge you again to use this as a checklist when preparing and uploading your application to ensure that all relevant documents comprising a complete application are submitted. And I'm gonna warn you up front, please bear with me as I'll be covering a lot of information um, relative to these files. Remember, much of this is documented in section 4.C, content and form of the application, which begins on page 41 of the FOA document. So applications must include an application for federal assistance. The application for federal assistance is a, format, a formal application for funding. The form must be signed by an authorized representative of the applicant. And by signing, the authorized representative is making certain certifications and assurances. And therefore, the form must either be digitally signed or printed, signed, and scanned before being uploaded as part of the application. Note that the forms and templates can be obtained from the ERE Exchange webpage under Required Application Documents by clicking Required Application Documents hyperlink uh, to the FOA forms are revealed and you can then download, complete, and then upload as part of your application. All other elements are self-generated by the applicant. So the second one is the summary abstract for public release. Applications are required to submit a one-page summary of the proposed project for public release. This is not a specific format. However, page 36 of the FOA document provides a list of the information that should be included on that summary. A summary slide. It's a single PowerPoint slide that provides quick facts about the proposed project. The slide content, content requirements are provided in the FOA and a template provided as part of the required application documents on the ERA exchange. The technical volume is the key submission element describing the proposed project and addressing the merit review criteria. The technical volume must not exceed 15 pages, excluding the cover page and table of contents, as DOE will only review the first 15 pages. See the table beginning on page 45 of the FOA document and for some very specific and format information of the technical volume. The table provides details on the content of each section of the technical volume. 
Briefly, the technical volume should include a cover page. See instructions on page 45 of the SOA. The cover page is not counted against the 15 page limit. It should include a table of contents, again, not counted against the page limit. Executive summary, the project description and outcomes, and roles, responsibilities, capabilities, and commitments. Comprise the technical volume. The work plan. The work plan is not part of the technical volume, but is included as a separate file. The work plan should describe the work to be accomplished and how the applicant will achieve project milestones. The work plan must not exceed five pages, and that excludes the milestone table. See pages uh, 57 through 59 of the FOA for very specific content. Also be aware of the work plan template, which includes instructions and examples has been provided in the ERE exchange under the required application documents. A template is also included as Appendix C of the FOA document. Project metrics file data is a required file. This file needs to include specific project-related data, including the type of technology, payback period of the project, expected cost savings, type of buildings, number of buildings, installed capacity, cost per installed watt, square foot of building space affected, electricity reliability data, electricity access information, environmental impacts, possible jobs created, and other questions. The Microsoft Excel template has been provided on EER Exchange under required application documents. An options analysis. All applicants are required to submit an options analysis. And this demonstrates that other options were considered and that the proposed system or infrastructure best meets the overall tribal objectives. Specifically, an options analysis for purposes of this FOA is a systematic assessment and evaluation of possible alternative approaches available for achieving a specific energy objective and determining which of those options are the most effective and provides the best solution to achieve those objectives. Such an analysis is intended to explore all feasible technology alternatives, conventional technologies, renewable technologies, energy efficiency measures, energy storage systems, integrated energy systems, and energy infrastructure, and to provide evidence that the proposed project choice can actually be implemented and is the best option available among all feasible alternatives. See Appendix C for an options analysis format. A Microsoft tem a Word template has also been provided and is available under the required application documents on EERE Exchange. The use of the options analysis template is not required, but the information included in that template is required. The feasibility and energy audits file. All applicants are required to submit either a feasibility study and or energy audits or industrial assessments as specifically required for each topic area. So to, uh, to include energy audits and energy assessments are required for topic area 1B and 1C and a feasibility study or studies for topic area 1A, 1C, topic area 2, topic area 3, and topic area 4. Any other relevant background or supplemental data may be included under the site and resource map and graphics file. Eligibility statements, which we've spoken of uh, previously. All applicants are required to submit eligibility statements that document and provide evidence of the applicant and land status eligibility to support DOE's eligibility determination. Microsoft Word template has been provided. This template is available, again, under the required application documents under EERE Exchange specific to this FOA. The use of the eligibility statements and evidence template is not required again, but the information included in that template is required. Note that, that this form must be signed by an authorized representative, either digitally or manually. 
So the next one, all applicants are required to submit an applicant tribal council resolution or declaration of commitment and cost sharing file. This will include the statement of commitment and cost sharing by the applicant. See page 61 for more specific information that is needed as part of this uh, commitment. For Indian tribes, the statement of commitment and cost sharing must be in the form of an executed tribal council resolution. Unless an Indian tribe does not have a tribal council. If an Indian tribe does not have a tribal council, the statement of commitment and cost sharing may be in a format other than a tribal council resolution, but must include evidence of the statutory or other legal authority authorizing that form of commitment in lieu of a tribal council resolution. For Alaska Native Regional Corps or Village Corporations, intertribal organizations, or tribal energy development organizations, the statement of commitment and cost sharing may be in the form of a declaration or a resolution signed by an authorized representative able to commit the entity. Remember, cost share must be available or accessible at the time of submission of the application. A written assurance or commitment must be provided at the time the application is submitted. That written assurance or commitment is a binding guarantee the funds are available or with respect to the use of equipment, contributed labor hours, or unrecovered indirect costs accessible. Cost share commitments cannot be dependent on some future event, such as receiving a grant, obtaining a loan, or securing an investor. And the recipient is ultimately and legally responsible for the entire amount of the cost share if an award is made. Therefore, that commitment for the total amount of the cost share, specific dollar amount, or up to a maximum amount or percentage of total costs, regardless of the source, is required as part of that applicant tribal council resolution or declaration of commitment of cost share and file. Again, please see the instructions beginning on page 61 for the content of these commitments. For those familiar with previous flows, you'll notice that the applicant commitment is now a separate file from those of the project participants. However, letters of support by anyone not participating in the proposed project and are not required or desired and should not be provided as part of the application. The participant letters of commitment and cost sharing file needs to include letters of commitment and cost sharing from all other project participants except for vendors. The letters must be specific to the FOA, and if cost share is being committed, include a statement of the total amount and type of cost share being committed, and a detailed estimate of the cost share value, which is the basis of and nature of, of all contributions of the project by the project participant. Remember, letters of support by anyone not participating in the proposed project are not required, desired, and should not be provided. Um, see more on page 63 of the FOA document, 63 and 64. Remember, the table of required application elements beginning on page 42 of the FOA can be used as a checklist of the elements to be included as part of the application. Next slide, please. So we'll briefly go over each of the remaining components of an application. And I know we're going to run pretty late here, and I apologize um, up front, but I will try to talk quick. So we're going to briefly go over each of the remaining components of an application. Again, there's a lot of information relative to, to the elements on this slide, so please bear with me. In addition to the components covered on the preceding slide, an application must also include the following. Under the resume files, all applicants are required to provide a resume file for the business context and the technical context. And each key person proposed, including tribal staff, as part of the project. A key person is any individual who contributes a, sub a sub substantive measurable way to the execution of the project. Each resume must not exceed two pages. 
and you need to save all those resumes into a single file and upload it with your application. A budget justification worksheet, Form IE-335, is a required form. It must include both the funds being requested from DOE as well as those proposed to the cost share. So let me repeat, the budget and budget justification must reflect all project costs regardless of whether those funds are being requested from DOE or provided to cost share. The form itself is a multi-tab Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. In addition to the proposed cost, the form requests the basis of estimate for the cost being proposed. The form can be downloaded again, like all the other forms and templates from the ERE Exchange website under the required application documents. So applicants must provide a separate budget justification form for each subrecipient that is expected to perform work estimated to be more than 250,000 or 25% of the total work effort, whichever is less. In this case, a subrecipient is a subawardee who is providing cost share or one with a vested interest in the proposed project beyond providing goods and services to the proposed project. If none of the proposed subrecipients meet the threshold above, a subrecipient justific justification form is not required and instead a file stating no subrecipients being proposed meet the threshold requirement and therefore subrecipient budget justification form is not being provided here as an attachment. So you have to submit a file regardless. Um, otherwise, the system won't allow you to submit the application. Vendor budget information um, should not in be included as part of the subrecipient budget justification, but rather included as part of the applicant's budget. So the vendor is an entity contracted to provide goods and services within their normal business operations. Who provides goods and services, goods or services to many different purchasers and operates in a competitive environment. Budget support file. All recipients are required to submit support for their proposed budget to include indirect rate agreements, breakdown of fringe costs, basis of cost estimate documentation, budget support for vendors, requests for DOE approval of subawardees selected non-competitively, and other relevant supplemental information. A Microsoft Word template has been provided, and this template is available again, as all they are, um, on ER Exchange. And again, the use of the budget support template is not specifically required, but the information in the template is required. Financial audit, all applicants must provide a copy of the most recent single audit for nonprofits, states, local governments, and educational institutions, or for for-profit entities, a copy of their most recent independent audit. Sites and resource maps and graphics files, again, each of these files, all of them are required. All applicants must provide a site and resource and graphics file and include any graphics or supplemental information to the technical volume, including maps, photographs, or other visuals of the project location or buildings affected by the proposed project. Any other relevant background or supplemental data may be included here, excluding the options analysis and studies and plans, which are submitted separately. If you choose not to provide not to provide any graphics, relevant background or supplemental data beyond that which is in the technical volume or the other files, submit a statement um, saying no additional site resource maps or graphics information is being provided as an attachment. Note that this information may actually be necessary to complete your application and to fully address the merit review criteria. So we're getting closer, bear with me. <laughs> All this information is included under section 4C of the FOA document. Design and engineering file. All applicants must provide a design and engineering file and include copies of any hardware performance specs, warranties, engineering drawings, and any other design and engineering data to supplement the technical volume. 
the requisite material and or equipment list for any proposed EEMs, energy efficiency measures, should be included here. Note that this information will supplement the technical volume and be used in reviewing technical viability. If you choose not to provide a design and engineering information, just a second, sorry about that. If you choose not to provide any design or engineering information beyond that which is in the technical volume, you need to submit a file stating no additional design and engineering information is being provided as an attachment. But again, this information may actually be necessary to complete your application and to fully address the merit review criteria. Next is the economics file. And this includes supplemental data to support the economic analysis, including, as a minimum, cash flow analysis, unless it's included as part of the technical volume. If you choose not to provide an economic information uh, beyond that, which is in the technical volume, again, you need to submit a file because all files are required. No additional economic information is being provided as an attachment. And again, that information may be required to complete your application and address the merit review criteria. Subcontract plan. The subcontract plan is required if subawardees have not been selected. The subcontract plan should include a description of the selection process to be employed, statement of work, and the criteria to be used for that selection. The subcontract plan may be supplemented by excerpts of the applicant's procurement policy and procedures. I say supplemented, not, not in place of. Any project participants not competitively selected must be approved by DOE. So if you have selected your subrecipients or vendors, submit a file stating the subcontract plan is not applicable as subawardees proposed under the application have not been selected non-competitively. And as such, request for DOE approval is being submitted as part of the budget support file. And that, that template, that file, will actually ask the questions and, and sort of guide you to what the attachments need to be. Registration and certifications. Again, all applicants must certify that all system registrations have been completed and certified to those registrations as part of the registration certification file. A Microsoft Word template has been provided. The registration certification template is available again, like all of them, on EERE Exchange. And again, that use of that template is not required, but the information included in the template is required. And lastly, a disclosure of lobbying activities form is required to be submitted, regardless of whether funds are being paid or will be paid for influencing or attempting to influence persons in connection with this application. So recipients and subrecipients may not use any federal funds to influence or attempt to influence directly or indirectly congressional action on any legislative appropriation matters. All applicants are required to complete, submit the SFFFF form disclosure of lobbying activities and disclose if any non-federal funds have been paid or will be paid to any person for influencing or attempting to influence any of the following in connection with this application. An officer or employee of any federal agency, member of Congress, an officer or employee of Congress, an employee of of a member of Congress. So if no non-federal funds have been paid or will be paid to any person for influencing or attempting to influence any of the above, any of the above in connection with your application, you need to indicate none and sign and date the form. And that form again is available on EERE Exchange. All work under the DOE funding agreements must be performed in the United States. This requirement does not apply to the purchase of supplies or equipment 
so a waiver would not be required for foreign purchases of these items. However, the recipient, and the, if an award is made, should make every effort to purchase supplies and equipment within the United States. If work is to be formed outside of the U.S., a waiver must be requested. For more on the content of the waiver, see section 4.h.3 of the FOA document. If work will not be conducted outside the United States, a waiver is not needed. However, you need to submit a file because there are files required stating a waiver to perform work outside the United States is not being requested under this application. And again, to ensure you're submitting all required components of an application, I would again urge you to use the table beginning on page 42 of the FOA document as a checklist. Note that you may submit an application any time before the due date, and I would urge you to do so because you will be able to update um, as needed up until the deadline. So please allow sufficient time to ensure you have uploaded all required documents and that your application is complete prior to the due date and time. Next slide, please. So now we'll cover the application eligibility requirements. Just another reminder. Oh my gosh, we are so late. <laughs> I apologize. Hey, geez. I thought I cut this back, so it, anyway, I apologize for, for being so long. Now we'll cover the applicant eligibility requirements. So just another reminder, if there are any inconsistencies between the FOA announcements, this presentation, or statements from DOE or other personnel, the FOA document is the controlling document, and applicants should rely solely on the FOA language or seek clarification by sending your questions to tribal grants at hq.doe.gov. Slides and audio recording of the webinar will be posted, and you will be notified as a registrant of the webinar, you will be notified when that, uh, those are available. Okay. As we previously pointed out, applicants must submit applications no later than 5 o'clock Eastern time on July 1st, 2020. Note again that the deadline is 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, once submitted, DOE will conduct an eligibility review. An application will be deemed eligible only if the application is an eligible entity and the project is located on tribal land. Refer to Section 3A of the FOA eligibility information, which begins on page 31 of the document and the uh, preceding slides. Another eligibility requirement is cost share. Required cost share must be at least 50% of the total allowable cost of the project as required by statute. Remember the sum of both the DOE share and the recipient share of allowable cost equals total allowable cost of the project. The application is eligible if it complies with the content and form requirements, meaning every single one of those files is submitted and the applicant successfully uploaded all required documents and clicked the submit button by the deadline. In other words, a complete application submitted by the deadline. Section uh, C, Section 3C of the FOA for compliance criteria. And an application is eligible if the proposed project is responsive to the intent of the FOA. And that's in Section 1, Section 3D of the FOA specifically applications not responsive to the intent of the FOA as described in 1A and 1B or identified as specifically not of interest as described in Section 1C will be deemed non-responsive and not be reviewed or considered. And the applicant is eligible if it meets the eligibility requirements identified in Section 3 of the FOA. So, Please be aware that DOE will not make any eligibility determinations prior to, to the date of which L, uh, applications are due. And again, I repeat the decision whether to submit an application um, in response to the FOA lies solely with the applicant. In other words, DOE will not advise you or make a determination on whether your entity or your proposed project are eligible prior to an application being submitted. 
so please don't seek advice from any DOE employee, DOE contractor, or laboratory staff. Next slide, please. So next, we're going to cover the merit review and selection criteria and process. Um, again, if you have questions, submit it to tribalgrants at headquarters.doe.gov. Slides and audio will be available. You'll be notified if you're registered. So regarding the merit review and selection process, um, the merit review and selection process consists of a series of reviews, including an initial eligibility review, which we just spoke about a rigorous technical review, and a programmatic review. The rigorous technical reviews are conducted by reviewers that are experts in the subject matter of the SOA. Ultimately, the selection official will consider the recommendations of those reviewers, along with other considerations such as program policy factors in making selection decisions. Next slide, please. And I'm just going to try to go quick. We're way behind. So this slide reflects the multi-tiered review process, which begins with an eligibility review. If an application and the applicant is determined eligible, the application undergoes a comprehensive technical review consisting of independent reviews by subject matter experts who provide ratings and document strengths and weaknesses of each application relative to the merit review criteria published in the SOA. After the independent merit review concludes, a federal consensus board begins its review. The federal consensus board's primary responsibility, because it's inherently a government function, is to determine the technical merit of each application and makes a selection recommendation based on that technical review. In other words, determines the selection range. Following the Federal Consensus Board, a merit review advisory report is produced, which describes the merit review, um, how it was conducted, sets forth the Federal Consensus Board technical rankings, addresses any of the FOA specific program policy factors, and that any other selection factors set forth in the FOA. Finally, um, the selection official reviews the merit review advisory report, considers the recommendations of the federal consensus board, applies program policy factors if he or she chooses, and makes a selection decision for negotiation and award. Next slide, please. So next, we're going to go over merit review criteria, what your application will be reviewed against. The four criterion and their weights are goals and objectives, which is the first part of the, of the uh, technical volume, is weighted at 10%. The options analysis required for every application is going to be weighted at 10%. That's a separate file. The project description and outcomes, which will be part of your technical volume, is weighted at 45%. So that's kind of the biggie. Um, that includes the project description, technical and economic viability, and the outcomes. Roles and responsibilities and capabilities and commitment is also part of the technical volume, and it's going to be weighted at 25%. And lastly, the work plan, which is a separate file, is weighted at 10, and you have a template for that, as well as the options analysis. And again, all of those templates are on the EER exchange. So beginning on page 42 of the FOA document is the list of the elements required for a complete application. And as previously addressed, some are for the forms and templates provided, and some elements will be need to be self-generated by the applicant. And again, I've used that table as a checklist when preparing and uploading your application. Make sure you get all the application elements. So beginning on page 45 of the FOA document is a table that that identifies the information that needs to be in the technical volume and it tracks to the merit criteria. And again, I'd recommend using that table as a guide when preparing your technical volume of your application. Next slide, please. On this slide and on page 75 of the FOA document, you'll see criterion one, goals and objectives, and the three sub-criterion that will be reviewed relative to that criterion. 
Also note that the content of the technical volume again is described in the table on pages 45 through 54 of the FOA. And the content of the work plan is described in the secondary table beginning on page 57. These tables follow the same order and they describe the required content on which this criteria will be applied. And I'll give you a minute to read through the slides. Next slide, please. So criteria two, that's the options analysis and it's required by everybody. You have a template, it's gonna be weighted at 10%. The, rate, the rating will be based on the credibility of the options analysis that demonstrates that, that other options were considered and that the proposed project best meets the overall tribal objectives. And again, all applicants are required to submit an options analysis. Specifically, as defined in the FOLA, an options analysis is a systematic assessment and evaluation of possible alternative approaches available for achieving specific energy objectives and determining which of the options are the most effective and provide the best solutions to achieve those objectives. Such an analysis is intended to explore all feasible technology alternatives, whether it be conventional technologies, renewables, energy efficiency measures, energy storage, integrated energy system, energy infrastructure, and to provide evidence that the proposed project that you're proposing, that project choice, can actually be implemented is the best option available among all feasible alternatives. Appendix E has a sample options analysis format and that format is actually provided as a template again on EERE Exchange. Next slide, please. Criterion three, this is the big one. <laughs> Project description and outcomes, this weighted at 45% of the technical volume. Um, and it can be supplemented by the engineering file, the economics file, the maps and graphics file, and all those other associated files um, to support this criterion. Um, criterion three is composed of four subcriterion. So One is the clarity and completeness of the detailed project description. The second is the technical viability of the proposed project. Again, this will be supplemented by the engineering file and possibly the maps and graphics file. The economic viability of the proposed project, that's another section of the technical volume, and will, can be supplemented with the economics file as a separate, uh, separate economics file. And then lastly, the significance of the outcomes. So under this criterion, the mandatory feasibility and or energy audits or assessments will be reviewed to assess the technical viability of the proposed project, along with the engineering and economics files. Note that the last three sub-criterion include multiple elements and that that criteria will be reviewed against. And I'll give you a moment to look through those. Next slide, please. And again, I apologize, we're, we're running so long. And here's the last two sub-criteria in the comprise criterion three, which is the economic viability and the outcomes. And the outcomes include the amount of energy saved, displaced, generated, economic benefits, environmental benefits, and, and other outcomes that may be important, uh, such as replicability, resiliency, environmental stewardship, you know, steps towards energy independent or, you know, whatever is related to the, the applicant's, you know, um, vision and uh, long-term plan. Next slide, please. These are all documented. The FOA um, tells you exactly how we're going to review and what we're going to review against your, your application, review your application against. 
So this is the fourth criterion. Roles, responsibilities, capabilities, and commitments, it's weighted at 25%, so a fairly substantial portion of the total rating. Um, and this will be reviewed against the soundness of the project management approach and the demonstrated level of commitment of the applicant and each participating organization. Now that uh, level of commitment can be evidenced by past related, uh, energy related efforts or the commitments um, as evidenced in, in the Tribal Council Resolution, Declaration, or, or other uh, commitment letters. And I'll give you just a, just a second to kind of read through that. Next slide, please. So the fifth and final criterion is the work plan, and it's weighted at 10%. Again, the work plan template is included in the ERE exchange under the required application documents and also as Appendix C of the FOA document. The work plan will be reviewed based on the clarity and completeness of the narrative description of each activity necessary to complete the project and the likelihood of achieving project objectives through this logical task structure. Next slide, please. So, oh. next on to selection factors. So, the selecting official may consider the merit review rec uh, recommendations, program policy factors, the amount of funds available in arriving at the selection decision under this follow. Next slide, please. After the technical merit review, the selection official may consider these program policy factors shown here to come to a final selection decision. The program policy factors are also included on page 77 of the FOA. Specifically, the selection official can consider in no particular order the geographic distribution, um, the technical diversity, degree to which the proposed project optimizes the use of available DOE funding, whether the entity is in an urban and economically distressed area, including quality operations, quality, qualified opportunity zones, pardon me, where the proposed project will occur in a QOC or otherwise advance the goals of quality, qualified opportunity zone. And whether the proposed project serves tribal communities with high energy costs, tribal communities not connected to the traditional centralized electric power grid, and applicants who have not previously received a grant from the Office of Indian Energy. And my apologies for the small font. Next slide, please. Okay, we're getting down there, I swear. We're getting closer to the end. Okay, so next we're gonna go over the mandatory registration requirements. We spoke about those before. I think we've got quite a bit of that covered. Um, so to apply for this FOA, applicants must register with and submit application materials through ERE exchange. So a control number will be assigned during that registration process. You need to retain that uh, control number and, and use that identifier on all application documents. There are also several one-time actions required before submitting an application in response to the FOA. And it is vital that applicants address these items as soon as possible, as some of these actions may take several weeks. Failure to complete them prior to submitting an application could result in DOE determining that the applicant is not qualified to receive a federal award or use that determination as a basis for not considering their application. The applicant will be required to certify that these registrations have been completed and to include that certification as part of their application. Therefore, it is essential that these registrations be completed as soon as possible as they may take several weeks to process. As I mentioned before, there are plans for the transition away from the former nine-digit fence number to a 12-digit non-proprietary unique identity identifier. U E I. 
During 2020, the DUNS number will be incrementally phased out and replaced with a new UEI number. The estimated completion, of course, that was prior to COVID-19, was December 31st, 2020. The transition will occur at the time the non-federal entity registers in SAMS.gov for the first time or renews the registration annually. SAMS.gov will generate the UEI number and assign it to the non-federal entity along with new login credentials issued through login.gov. Remember, applications will only be accepted through EERE Exchange and your registration at grants.gov will mean you'll receive email notifications if there are any amendments to the FOA. See section 6.B of the FOA beginning on page 80 for more required uh, registration information. Next. Okay, moving on to the application submission requirements and points of contact. Again, we won't have questions and answers. Send all questions to tribal grants at headquarters.doe.gov. The slides and audio recording will be available in about a week. You'll be notified if you are a registrant in this webinar. Next slide, please. Thank you. So all required submissions must, again, I don't know for the fourth, fourth time, come through EERE Exchange. DOE will not review or consider applications submitted through any other means. Please use the user's guide for applying to the Department of Energy funding opportunity announcements found on the ER Exchange under manuals. It is actually a step-by-step -step guide, including a screenshot on how to register and how to submit an application. Please note for this photo, there are no pre-application documents, such as a concept paper or letters of intent required nor will you be able to reply to reviewer comments as reviewer comments will not be provided to applicants until after selection from date. So please disregard those sections of the ER Exchange User Guide. Um, next slide, please. Next on to key information regarding submission of an application. So check. Check your entries in the ERE exchange. The submissions could be deemed ineligible due to incorrect entry. DOE strongly encourages applicants to submit applications one to two days, I'd say two, prior to the deadline to allow for full upload of application documents and to avoid any potential technical glitches. Make sure you push the submit button. Any changes made after you push the submit button will unsubmit your application and you will need to push the submit button again. For our records, print out the EERE Exchange confirmation. For your records, pardon me, print out the EERE Exchange confirmation page at each step, uh, which contains your application's control number. Applications that experience issues with submission prior to the FOA deadline to contact the Exchange Help Desk for assistance. And that is at eere-exchange support at hq.doe.gov. The Exchange Help Desk and or the Exchange System Administrators can assist applicants or may be able to assist applicants in resolving issues. The Office of Indian Energy is not able to assist with any of those technical issues associated with eere Exchange or to help a submittal of an application. Applicants that experience issues with submission that result in late submission should also contact the Exchange Help Desk for assistance. The Exchange Help Desk and or the ERE Exchange System Administrators may be able to assist. But I would also strongly encourage you to keep any records and or documentation, including screenshots, of any issues you experience in submitting your application and any efforts you've made to help resolve those issues. Next slide, please. In addition, per page 90 of the FOA, please keep in mind that all information provided by the application must, to the greatest extent possible, exclude personally identifiable information, PII. Specifically, applicants must uh, screen resumes to ensure that they do not contain PII 
such as personal addresses, cell phone numbers, personal emails, or social security numbers. In short, if the PII is not essential to the application, it should not be in the application. Next slide. So applicants must designate a primary and backup points of contact in the ERE exchange with whom DOE will communicate during the process. Remember, these are the contacts that will be used to notify application, applicants of whether their applications are deemed non-responsive, non-compliant, unsuccessful, or selected for negotiation and reward. It is imperative that the applicant or the selectee be responsive during award negotiations and meet the negotiation deadline. A failure to do so may result in cancellation of further award negotiations and or rescission of the selection. Next slide, please. We are getting closer to the end. I really, I swear. <laughs> um, next on to the forward questions. We've covered this uh, quite a number of times, but for questions regarding the FOA, send an email to tribalgrants at headquarters.doe.gov. Before submitting a question, I urge you to check the FAQ page on the ERE exchange to see if a similar question has already been answered. We will attempt to answer questions within three business days, and you will be notified when a response to your question is posted. Next. So contact EERE-exchange support at hq.doe for problems logging into EERE Exchange or problems uploading and submitting application documents to EERE Exchange. Specific questions regarding the FOA itself should be sent to tribal grants at hq.doe.gov. And please include the FOA number in the subject line of those emails. Next. Now on to best practices. So in closing, let's see, we're getting close. <laughs> and in closing, a few recommendations. Please download the funding opportunity announcement and read it thoroughly so that you understand all the steps and all the requirements for submitting an application. Do not just solely rely on this webinar. If you are considering submitting an application, Please register an EERE exchange as soon as possible and obtain that control number. Again, that control number must be included on all application documents. Check the frequently asked questions on EERE exchange periodically for any supplemental information um, relative to the FOA. Next. And in closing, here we go, moving right along. And a few final comments. Um, hopefully, we've, can, we've answered some of your questions, provided an overview of the FOA and the process. However, if you have any questions, please send us an email again, tribalgrants.headquarters.doe.gov. Please don't ask me, any other Office of Indian Energy staff, contractors, or laboratory personnel about the eligibility of your project or any other questions related to this FOA. Only formal responses posted under FAQs on the ERHJ's website will be honored. So the purpose of accepting only written questions is that typically, if you have a question, somebody else likely does as well. Also, this ensures that everyone has the same information relative to this competitive opportunity. Remember, registering in grants.gov means you'll receive email notices if any amendments to the FOA occur, but applications will not be accepted through grants.gov. Consider submitting your application early. I know it sounds good, nobody ever does, but consider it. You can always revise or update the files up until the application deadline. Um, I'd also like to invite you, if you're not already, to join the Office of Indian Energy email list. Uh, to join, see the main page of our website at www.energy.gov forward slash Indian Energy. By subscribing, you'll receive any information on this funding opportunity, funding opportunities through other agencies, training opportunities, webinars, 
and other upcoming events. For information on previously funded tribal energy projects, you can see projects on the website under navigation and for lists of other open funding opportunities, see funding. The Office of Indian Energy also offers technical assistance at no cost to tribes and tribal entities. If you're interested, please check out the technical assistance section of the website and submit a request. And again, the slides and audio recording for this webinar will be posted in the next week or so. And as a registrant, you'll be notified via email when that, those materials are available. Just a reminder that your participation in this webinar is completely voluntary. There are no particular advantages or disadvantages to the application evaluation process with respect to your participation in the webinar today. These slides and an audio uh, recording, again, is going to be posted um, and you'll be notified. Remember, if there's any inconsistencies between the funding opportunity announcement this presentation or statements from DOE or other personnel, the FOA document is the controlling document and applicants should rely solely on the FOA language or seek clarification by sending any questions to tribal grants at headquarters.doe.gov. Next slide, please. Ta -da. I'm so sorry this ran long, but thank you so much for your interest and for your attention during the webinar. Have a wonderful afternoon, and this concludes today's webinar. Goodbye.